Hey, this is Kenneth Kapodovanich tutoring, and it's time again to get into the letters. So now we're doing N. I hope I can get to O and P at the same time because they're not super big, but we're going to start. This episode is sponsored by the letter N. N is in Nancy. N is in nincompoop. N is, N is in not going to fall asleep while I'm doing this. Let's get into it. Okay, the first term you can hear is naked. Same as, oh, it's naked. Ah, naked is uncovered. Whenever you hear the word naked or uncovered, that means it's by itself. And it almost always means it's a sell of an option. So like a naked call is an uncovered call, which is like selling a call. An uncovered call is a naked call, which is not selling a call or selling a put. It's never really going to be buying. You don't buy naked, you sell naked. Like a naked short is actually when you short stock without getting a borrow, whatever. Okay. But you can also talk about NASDAQ. Basically, it's an exchange that's an over-the-counter exchange that is level one, level two, level three, all these different stuff. But the NASDAQ, is an exchange much like the New York Stock Exchange. The NASDAQ is a negotiated market where broker dealers deal with each other. And the New York Stock Exchange is a hybrid auction market where they deal with the exchange and they sit on a floor and they trade. It's a more electronic now, but the thought process is that we all, all the stocks trade in one spot. They have one DMM, designated market maker, like a specialist whose job it is to maintain a fair and orderly market. And you deal with the exchange, not really with each other, where on NASDAQ, you're negotiating broker dealer to broker dealer. NASAA, North American Securities Administrators Association. It sounds like a bunch of letters, but it's, and it's not the space one. It is an organization that is there to protect investors by writing the rules and all that for all the different state administrators, not FINRA, the state securities administrator. The National Judiciary Council, I can't even say, National Judiciary Council, that's basically if you get nailed by FINRA and you want to appeal it, that's who you go to. The Judiciary, National, the NAC, the National Judiciary Council, don't ask me to spell it, is the council where we get appeals. We Anything we get screwed up on, we appeal on. <clears throat> okay. Now we have capital markets and national capital. I don't like that. We're going to do them anyway. National capital versus national global. National capital markets are like the old small caps, okay? Then national global are the large caps. And then national global select are the biggest. So it's all about market capitalization. We've talked about that. Market cap is what the company's worth. So a small market cap company is a, is a national capital market. They have less uh, listing requirements. They're not as liquid, stuff like that. Global market is the bigger ones. Those are the bigger companies. And that's the old large caps. And then global select is the bigger one. Okay. That's the highest one. They have the most strict requirements to get in there. They're more strict than global market. They're similar to the New York Stock Exchange listing requirements. NAV, net asset value. Okay. NAV is the net asset value. That's going to be what, what you pay for the mutual fund. Yeah. When you buy in, you pay NAV plus a sales charge. But NAV is net asset value. It's what it, and they, they calculate it once a day. When you buy a mutual fund or any kind of investment company, they have an NAV. If it's an open-end fund, you are buying it on the NAV plus a sales charge. And when you sell it, you sell it at the NAV. If you have to do the math, it's assets minus liabilities divided by the number of outstanding shares. Okay. A negative consent letter. A negative consent letter is basically if I say to you, hey, do you mind if I do this? Only respond if you have a problem with it. Usually what happens with net basis trades. Well, we're on this. So a net basis trade is when we do a principal trade, but we don't disclose the commission or the, or the markup to you. So it's kind of like when you buy shares at 40, I'm going to sell to you at 41 and say, hey, you bought them at 41. I built in a dollar markup or profit, but I don't disclose that to you. So if I want to do that, if you're an institution, I have to send you a negative consent letter saying, hey, we do pre-do net basis trades. Do you have a problem with that? If you do, let us know. If you don't, if you don't say anything, we're going to assume you're okay. We can only do that with institutions. You have to actually get permission from a retail customer to do what I just said. So again, negative consent letter means you only come back if you if you don't say anything. We're, we think we're okay with it. Okay, so now negotiable versus auction market. So the Nasdaq is considered a negotiable market. Okay, and then. Um, the New York Stock Exchange's auction is hybrid, okay? But we're going to go back to that. Negotiable means tradable. So there's really two types of things that can happen. Either a security is negotiable, which means it trades on the market, or it's redeemable, which means you buy and sell from the issuer like a mutual fund or a UIT or an annuity. Okay, a negotiable CD. It's a money market. It's usually a minimum of 100 grand, and it pays um, interest paying. And it's negotiable, which means you can trade it between parties. Not so much trade on the exchanges, but you can get in and out of it. You don't have to hold it the entire time. That's what negotiable means. Again, back to that tradable. Okay, net income. Net income is basically um, 
your earnings minus all the costs of depreciation, interest, expenses, taxes, selling, all that. It's your net income. It's it basically think of net income after all your expenses, kind of like your paycheck. I make, say I make 10 grand in a month and I only bring home like seven or six because all the taxes and everything come out of it. So net income is what you're actually, the income after all the expenses you're taking on. Taxes, everything. Now there's net interest cost and true interest cost. It's the way they measure where they decide who's going to win the bid for a muni offering. So I'm a municipality. I do an auction. I do. I send it out there and say, hey, everyone, a competitive offering. Everyone, please decide where you're going to, um, what we're going to bid on it. And we either do it NIC or TIC. NIC or TIC. Don't go in too deep into it. Just NIC does not take into account time value of money, where true interest costs does take into account time value of money. I would go with that one. Net revenue pledge. That so there's gross revenue and net revenue. So th what th again back to the munis, right? So if we have a municipal bond, and we decide, okay, where are we paying the debt service? Debt service is the interest and in, in principal payments. Are we paying them out of the top line or the bottom line? Again, what the fuck does that mean? Top line means if it's gross revenue pledge, which is which we talked about already, probably gross revenue pledge. We may we pay the debt service before we pay any expenses or maintenance stuff. If it's net revenue pledge, we pay the maintenance and operations and maintenance, and then we pay the debt service. So gross, you're paying out of the top line, out of the gross money, and net revenue means you're paying the interest payments out of the net revenue after all the expenses and maintenance are taken out. Net investment income. It's basically. What so when companies invest, they earn interest and dividends and stuff. So what they're going to do is they're going to get that money, deduct all. I always remember net means you're deducting your expenses, right? Just think that way. So it's taking the interest and dividend payments it gets from investments, subtracting the taxes and ex operating expenses and all that stuff, and then that's your net investment income. Net present value. Net present value is you need. Net present value is basically the difference between the present value. And the market price. So if we if we have to find present value, we take the future value, use discounted cash flow to find present value, which is like a fair market value right now, or expected price. If the market price is below that, it's a positive NPV and worth investing. If the if the if the market price is above it, then it's a negative NPV. Like if I have a thousand dollar bond in three years at five percent, it that that it's going to mature in three years at a thousand dollars. Right now, it should be worth a present value of eight fifty five or eight sixty making up numbers. It, so that's the present value. If I could actually buy it for less than that, that's a positive NPV. That's a good thing. If I have to pay more than that for that, it's a negative NPV and I probably wouldn't do it. Net worth. What the hell is net worth? Net worth is what either you or an entity or firm's actual value is. So it's assets minus liabilities. A company's total assets minus total liabilities on a public company. It's also called shareholders equity. What's a new issue? A new issue is like an IPO. Like the, it's a first time issuance. Okay. It's basically the first time we issue either a bond or a stock or whatever it is. It's the first time we issue that. Okay. Usually what they call an IPO and this is going to come with a prospectus. We have to register with the SEC, stuff like that. What's a no load fund? A no load fund is a mutual fund that has no front end or back end sales charge and they can charge a 12B1 fee, but it has to be under 25 basis points or under 0.25% of the net asset value. Do not, you cannot call C shares or B shares no load. No load has is specifically to what it is. Nominal yield is also known as a stated. Nominal yield is stated rate, is the interest rate, is the coupon. Boom. Okay, non accredited versus accredited. So an accredited investor is a one, two, three accredited, right? One million net worth or 200 salary or 300 salary, if miserable, I mean married, or they have a Series 7 or a 65 or an 82, right? Those are accredited investors they can buy on Reg D. A non-accredited investor is not that. Someone who's less than that, who hasn't met the accreditation stuff, and they're very limited on what they can do. They're like the normal retail retail traders. Okay, so now we have non-contributory. Wow, I can't speak. Non-contributory plan. And then we have contributory. Non-contributory plan is like one where the customer, where the employee does not make contributions, only the employer does. That would be like a Kia. Um, or even like a profit sharing, I guess would be profit sharing would be one too. Non-cumulative preferred, non-cumulative preferred. Remember, preferred is you know if they miss a dividend, they don't actually owe it. So if say I miss a dividend for three years in a row on a preferred stock and I never pay it, 
if it's cumulative, I have to make up all those dividends before I can pay anything else. If it's non-cumulative, screw it, you're out. If I didn't pay that year, I don't owe anything beyond that. So cumulative is better for the customer because it's going to have a lower return because it's it's more protecting um, of the past dividends. Non-cumulative, eh, if I don't pay, you're out of luck. Non-exempt security. So a non-exempt security, remember, exempt means it doesn't have to register, like a bank, um, a government, something like that. Exe non-exempt means it has to register. And I always think of non-exempt as like corporate, but they either have to register under the Act of 33 and then follow the Act of 34 stuff. So non-exempt pretty much means corporate without an exception. And remember something, you can only be exempt from two things. You cannot be exempt from risks. You can only be exempt or non-exempt from taxes or registration. So non-exempt security is one that has to register. An exempt security does not have to register. It might be exempt from taxes. Who knows? Okay, a non-issuer transaction. So a non-issuer transaction is between like you and me. So if you buy shares of Ford stock, right? Okay, if you buy shares of Ford, okay? then you're not buying it from Henry Ford or the company. You're buying it from like John or Mary or Bobby or Sue, right? Horrible names. But you're buying it from someone else. That's a non-issuer transaction. A non-issuer transaction is a secondary market trade. It is a secondary trade between two investors. An issuer transaction is when you buy it from the actual company and the actual company gets money out of that, okay? So that could be an IPO. That could be a follow-on, additional, anything where a company is issuing shares and you're paying them. So like when you buy into a mutual fund, you're buying it from the mutual fund, and you're, that's an issuer transaction. When the mutual fund makes trades in its portfolio, that's a non-issuer transaction, okay? So when a mutual fund makes their own trades, it's a non-issuer transaction. When you buy from mutual, when you buy when you buy from a mutual fund or a company like an IPO, you're absolutely buying an issuer transaction because they're getting the money. Okay, non-marginable, pretty much shit that's not on Nasdaq. But let's go down the list. Over the counter bulletin board and pink sheets are normally not marginable. Options with nine months or less maturities are not option are not marginable and IPOs are not marginable for the first 30 days. That's why when you buy a mutual fund, you can't buy it on margin. But once it's traded for 30 days, then you can borrow against it. Non-NASDAQ security means it's not trading on NASDAQ. It's an over-the-counter equity, okay? A non-NASDAQ security means it's an equity security that's not traded on NASDAQ. So it's an over-the-counter, which means pretty much pink sheet or bulletin board if even bulletin board is a thing anymore. Non-qualified annuity. A non-qualified annuity or non-qualified retirement plan. I should just do it that way. A non-qualified retirement plan means it's not sponsored by a corporation for the most part. More importantly, it's not protected by ERISA. So you don't get the same protections as an ERISA, ERISA qualified plan. And remember, most contributions to non-qualified plans are not deductible, which means you're paying taxes on them. But the good thing is, is then once you're older, say you put in 20 grand and it grows to 500 grand, woo -woo, um, we pay only pay tax, we pay tax on the 480. We don't pay tax on the 20 you put in. That's a non-qualified plan, not protected under arrest. Remember, these are high level stuff. I have videos where I go deep dive on all this shit. So pay attention. Non-qualified stock option plan. It's basically a stock option plan which is non-qualified and the difference between the market price and the strike price is taxable. That's the thing. So if you, the whole point of a non-qualified stock option plan is that you can pay taxes on it. And they will talk about this stuff on the exams now. Non-recourse loans means you put money in, you borrow, but you do not owe any of the money if the partnership fails. But if a recourse loan means they have recourse against you, that means if the partnership fails, you can be liable for the money you borrowed. Like they may be gone, but you still owe the money. Kind of like a student loan. Non-systematic risk, okay? Non-systematic risk is like business risk, okay? Systematic risk is market risk, right? You just, it's it, you can't diversify that away. You can buy options to hedge it, but you can't diversify it away. Non-systematic risk is like business risk. You can diversify that by buying mutual funds, ETFs, having a bigger portfolio, using modern portfolio theory to diversify that risk away. You can diversify a non-systematic risk, business risk, but you cannot diversify away systematic risk. Okay, we have a normal yield curve and an inverted yield curve. A normal yield curve, I've done videos on this, so try to link it here. But a normal yield curve, a normal yield curve looks like this, right? Short, short yields, lower rates, the longer, right? So that's so these are the years. This is the yields, right? It could be either way. This is the maybe this is the yields, this is the years. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. The shorter your borrow, the lower the rate. That's a normal yield curve. But what's going on now, like when the Fed starts raising rates, 
they start raising the rates. So all of a sudden, boom, now you have an inverted yield curve where the shorter term, you're paying a higher rate on shorter term stuff, which is not normal. So normal, you can't use that word, right? But normal is like what we expect. You borrow money for a longer time, you pay higher rates. You borrow money for a shorter time, you pay lower rates. And an inverted, usually a sign of a recession or the Fed raising rates or tightening, the shorter rate is going to be higher than the longer rate, which is just not normal. That's inverted. Note usually means short term. It could be under a year, but usually just means a shorter term. Like treasury notes are two to 10 years. Muni notes are like under two kind of things. So notes are always pretty much the shorter term bonds. Okay. Not held order. Basically, a not held order is when you give your broker discretion, not like not like the full power of attorney discretion, but the ability to choose the time and price, meaning you can give them an order to buy a thousand shares not held, and they can decide any point in the day to buy the shares when they think it's right. That's a not held order. You do not need written power of attorney for that. Notice of sale. A notice of sale is when a municipal issuer puts a notice in the bond buyer to say, hey, we're issuing a bond. We want the issuers to um, bid on it. Now, that's not to be confused with notice filing. Notice filing is when like a federal covered security, like whether it's a federal covered IA or certain federal covered securities, they just file notice in the state to let the state know they're there. They provide the documents that the SEC requires. So they require, they give those documents to the states, but the states don't really have jurisdiction. It's just a record keeping thing to say, hey, we're here, whatever. Okay, that's the end. Now it's time for O's. Like, oh my God, I can't believe we're still doing this. That it's, oh my God, it's still so long. Like, oh my Lanta. Okay, so let's get into the O's. Okay, what's an odd lot? Odd lot. Odd lot is an amount less than 100 shares. So a round lot is 100 shares or more. An odd lot is between 1 and 99 shares. And usually odd lots don't show up on the tape or even in the bid and offer on the book or anything. They're just what usually retail people use. And that's why we lead into odd lot theory. Odd lot theory is the theory that in retail people are idiots. Normal people buy less than 100 shares at a time. Institutions buy 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 20,000, whatever. Retail people buy odd lots and retail people are idiots. So we figure if there's a lot of odd lot buying, then it's probably a bearish because you're always, the idea is that they're always wrong, right? They're late to the game. So if they're a bunch of buying, that's too late. So you probably should start selling. If there are a lot of people selling, maybe it's time to buy. That's odd lot theory. Okay. An offer. An offer is, so it depends. If it's under NASA, there's offer and sale. So an offer is the attempt. Okay. I guess it's sort of the same. An offer is the attempt. The sale is a transaction. But another way is an offer on the on the Nasdaq or Finra trading side, there's bids and offers, right? Bid is where people want to buy. Offers or ask is where people want to sell. So it works on two things. An offer is the attempt to make a sale. The to sale is the actual transaction. Or two is the offer is the um I want a, a price that I'm willing to sell it at. An offer or an ask. An offering circular. An offering circular is like a disclosure doc, a little mini prospectus, usually for a regulation A offering. Not every reg A needs to do it, but if they have to, then it's offering circular, not a prospectus. The Office of Supervisory Jurisdiction, that is a broker dealer's main like branch. Doesn't they can have more than one, but it's where all the compliance, all the approval of new accounts, trading, market making, supervision, all that stuff. So the way it goes is there's the main office, blah, blah, blah. There's OSJs, which are like they're supervising the other branches where they can do all the trading, the market making, the compliance, the investment banking, all that stuff. And then below that is the branch office where you can just do sales. The OSJ looks over the BS, the branch. And an OSJ is a firm. A lot of places you work at, they go, oh, he's the OSJ. No, that just means he or she is the manager of the OSJ. The OSJ is actually the, the office where they supervise the branches and other Oh, shades maybe. Okay, open end mutual fund, open end investment company is an a mutual fund, right? An open end investment company is a mutual fund. Closed end is a closed end. Open end is a mutual fund. Okay, opening purchase and opening sale is when you either buy or sell options for the first time. So an opening purchase is when you buy options for the first time. So if you buy a call or buy a put for the first time, that's an opening purchase followed by a closing sale. If you short a call or write a call for the first time, that's an opening sale, which is followed by a closing purchase. Okay. Open market operations. Open market operations is when the Federal Reserve, under the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, is buying and selling treasuries 
from the banks to either increase the, mar- the the economy, the money in the economy, or decrease it. So during expansion, they're going to sell treasuries to take money away from the banks. And during contraction, or when they need to inject money, accommodating, um, or QA, they're going to be buying treasuries to put money into the banks. An omitting prospectus is a type of mutual fund advertising. So what happens is, if I'm a mutual fund, I can send a prospectus or I can send an omitting prospectus which is a slimmed down version. It has all the material information, but not everything you need in there. It cannot be associated with an application to invest. If you want to invest, you're going to have to get an actual statutory prospectus at some point. Open-end bond indenture. Okay, the open-end and closed-end. So open-end is where if I issue bonds now, you have a certain level of priority. If open-end means I can issue more bonds after that have the same level of priority as you do for my assets. That's an open end and that you don't want that. A closed end means I issue these bonds and then any more issues I bond I, or any more bonds I issue, stretch that, reverse it, they're going to have lesser priority, which means you get first shot at the money. If we go, if I have to pay or get bankrupt, you'll get paid first and then the other ones will be like junior to. They'd be like subordinate to you. You want a closed end indenture because then if you buy a bond from me and, and I issue the bond based on my earnings and all that, you, you feel safe to go, look, I know this is how many bonds are being issued based on the earnings. I think they can pay. And then if I do a closed end, that means even if I issue more bonds, they get paid after you as opposed to with you. But if it's an open end, they come on and they have just as much a claim to my assets and earnings as you do, which kind of dilutes your leverage, I guess, credit. Open order. An open order is basically slang for good to cancel. If they, if they say it's an open order, that's how we call it. It's an open order. It's an open order. It's a good to cancel. Operating income is basically the income, the net sales minus the cost of goods sold and all that stuff. So operating income is our sales minus all the expenses, depreciation, cost of goods, costs, and stuff like that. It's going to be on the income statement. Operating income, obvious income, is on the income statement. Options. Options are derivatives. That means their pro- their value is based on another asset. So you can have index options, equity options, but specifically equity options. If you buy a call, you have the right to buy stock at a price. If you buy a put, you have the right to sell stock at a certain price. And if you sell those options, you gave that right to someone else. Not going to get into this high level stuff. The Options Clearing Corp is the organization that kind of supervises the options and guarantees performance. That doesn't mean they're guaranteeing making money. They guarantee that if you buy a call and I sell it to you and I disappear, you'll... uh, and you exercise and I disappear, then they will guarantee that you get to buy your stock and then they will chase me down. Okay, optimal portfolio, what's that? Under modern portfolio theory, it's trying to find the most amount of reward with a given level of risk. Again, the highest reward with a given level of risk. Ordinary income. Ordinary income is basically not capital gains. There's two types of income, really. I mean, there's passive too, but there's capital gains, which is that whole buy and sell, buy and sell, option expiration or mutual fund distribution of capital gains, or everything else is ordinary income, which is taxed at your um, normal rate. Like, look at your paycheck. Whatever you bring home from your paycheck, that's how it's being taxed. OTC market, over-the-counter market, is the trading system where it's broker-dealers dealing with broker-dealers directly, not on an auction exchange. So it's basically J.P. Morgan buying right from uh, Morgan Stanley or from Options Disclosure Doc, the ODD. An option disclosure doc is what you remember the DATO 15 that I created, D A T O 15, disclosure, then approval, then trade, then options agreement, uh, 15 days later. ODD is the disclosure doc that you have to hand someone before they before they can open an account. They get the disclosure doc telling them how dangerous options are, then it gets approved by the ROP, the principal. OID, original issue discount, literally a zero coupon. It's issued below part. And remember, OID, you must agree. OID, you must accrete. Outstanding shares. That's how many shares are out there in trading, okay? So it's issued minus treasury equals outstanding. Authorized doesn't matter. Authorized is just authorized, okay? That's what we're authorized to issue. Then we have we can issue a certain amount of them. And then if we buy some back in treasury, what's left is outstanding. So when we issue stock, if we issue a million shares, we have a million outstanding. If we buy back 100,000 of it, we now have 900,000 outstanding. And tr- in the not 100 in Treasury. Now remember, Treasury stock, once it's issued, it's always been issued, but it's kind of been issued and bought back. Okay. Overbought. Overbought 
is a technical trading term. Like if it gets near the resistance, it's, it's thought to be bought too much. So it's probably going to come down. Again, that's a technical. Kind of like oversold is the other. When it's too low, we think it's going to go up. I always think of that um, that Greek. Like I always think of the guy Icarus who flew too close. He was told not to fly too close to the water because it would get wet or too high. So you want to stay in the middle. Overbought, too high. Oversold, too low. And by the way, oversold would be near support. Overbought would be near resistance. That helps. Overlapping debt. Remember, this is 100% not in alphabetical order because I'm trying to come up with words. Overlapping debt. Normal geo bonds. If I issue a geo bond in my town of Chatham, we ha it has to stay inside the town. But we actually have a high school that uses Chatham Township and Chatham Borough. So our taxes actually leave the town, and that's overlapping. So like a county park system, a regional high school, a county library, where more than one town feeds in, if more than one town feeds into this project, that's overlapping or coterminous debt. Over the counter reporting facility, ORF. So when you do a trade on NASDAQ, you use TRF, trade reporting facility, to report the trade to act. If it's over the counter, you can use ORF over the counter reporting facility because we're idiots. We have to do it that way. And it still goes to act. It's like the same thing, but one's for ORF is for over the counter reporting, TRF is for NASDAQ. Oversubscribed. Okay. Oversubscribed is actually a good thing. That's what you want. An oversubscribed offering means it's like, say, we issue a million shares. And there's like 1.2 million offered. I mean, want it, okay? So if we have a million shares issued and we haven't sold them out yet, and all of a sudden there's over, over a million people who want the shares, that's oversubscribed. So the demand is greater than supply, which is a good thing. And that's why sometimes they have, they have the green shoe clause where you can issue an extra 15% to accommodate some of that demand. Okay, that's the O's, baby. O, O, O. Okay.